Before we start the uh, second half of, of, of the lecture, um, a, a small announcement. So, as we know, we have the, our first lecture was cancelled. So, um, what we can do is we're going to schedule that for the coming Wednesday. Hopefully, you guys ha have time for that. Uh, so, it's the next Wednesday, 1, uh, 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Um, we're going to talk about these, um, you know, basic retrieval um, algorithms. And the, the location is um, it's not here. It's uh, Darwin B40 at uh, um, Lecture Theater. So we basically have two lectures for the coming week, Wednesday and um, the Friday. Uh, we're going to continue you know, as, as, as it is. Um, so Friday will be here. Wednesday will be in another <coughs> lecture room. Um, but what I would like you to do is that have uh, um, a bit of study about probability and statistics if you um, still not familiar with it <coughs> by now. So um, it's um, what I what I list here is that there's three references. Um, you can go through it, which help you to understand. If you're not, you know, you have this. If you even you started to have some probabilities, you can still you know quickly go through to make sure you understand that. It's very basic kind of stuff. Um, again, also help to understand the probability have these um, two uh, lecture notes. So I think we're going to focus on these two lecture notes. It's not too, too many slides, but in total about 20 or 30 slides. So it's probably about half hour. Um, quickly go through it. Um, so I hope that you can you can even start now uh, to go through this. Uh, well, not now, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> after lecture. Um, then I hope we can finish up like um, coming um, Thursday or you know early morning um, Friday. So in in lab two we're going to talk about probabilistic probabilistic uh, retrieval model. So. So that actually will help you to understand uh, what I want, what you want. Okay, that's it. And any questions about the the two lectures it's coming Wednesday? Um, for the people who haven't been here, so I already sent the email. So make sure everybody you know don't know that. If you uh, you know, some of your fellow students don't know, you can actually call them. If you don't know the. Uh, there's a lecture in Wednesday. Or web search, or um, library 
sir, medical <coughs> search, and things like that. The queries are simulating what type of different queries that different users may submit. And the judgments simulate what people may think are relevant, what documents are relevant to this query in this document collection. Okay? So basically, we are just simulating different retrieval scenarios. And the way, the main uh, place where this type of evaluation started was actually in track. And this type of evaluating retrieval system using a test collection is called Cranfield paradigm. Okay? In which you have a document collection, a bunch of queries, and some judgments. So the goal of track, which is text retrieval conference, is really to provide a unified framework for people to evaluate the quality of their systems in an offline manner. Okay? So they create test collections for a set of different retrieval tasks. Again, this retrieval task can be block search, a, a, quite a few different tasks. Every year that track has a comes up with different types of proposals. Sometimes they are repeated across different years. But there are quite a few different tasks. And the goal of track was really to standardize the evaluation. Okay? So to make the IR community, for example, let's say you are Bing and the, and the, and the other company is Google. You want to say my search engine is better than Google, for example. Okay? If you use your own metric, no one will trust that, right? So you have to have a standard metric that you can use, and the goal of this community is really to provide you with the standard metrics, so that you, later on you can take it, you can write, run your system on this standard test collections they provide, and you can say, my system is better than this, okay? So that's the goal of TREK, and TREK also provides a standardized evaluation code, TREK around. So if you write your own information retrieval system, this is publicly available, you can just search for track, go to track website, download track eval, and the, the, some of the collections of track are also publicly available or uh, when you register for that. You can download the collections, and then you can just, uh, you have a basically um, test collection that you can run your system and evaluate your system and compare it with that of previous people's results, okay? So the results of previous systems, the results of systems that submitted their runs or rank lists on that collection, on these given uh, queries for that co test, test collection are, are also available online in the track website. So this gives you a mechanism to compare the quality of the system you build with that of other research groups to understand where you stand and so on as well. Okay. So this track amount, given an output of an IR system, it produces various sorts of different measures. There are really tons of different measures. Some of them are the ones that we have described here. Some of them are just functions of procedure recall, but there are quite a few of them. Okay? And uh, most researchers just use this uh, to save time so that they, they don't have to implement these metrics themselves. They are already implemented. Here's an output of the track amount system. Okay? So basically, once you run track eval for a single query, it creates, for example, the number of relevant documents retrieved, the number of uh, documents retrieved, and so on, together with the recall of your system. Okay? It also creates recall value, uh, your precision values at different recall levels, at fixed recall levels, starting from 0 to 1. Once you have this interpolated precision <coughs> recall precision curve that we talked about, you can just get the recall point, focus on these fixed recall points, even if they don't exist in your graph, because the graph now has become smooth, and get the corresponding precision values from there. Okay? So that's how uh, the precision values at fixed recall points, like 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and so on, is constructed. Then you have your precision values at various different documents. Okay, like at five documents, 15 documents, and so on. Okay. Then you also have the precision recall curve. And uh, you, uh, so, so that you can understand how precision uh, uh, changes with respect to recalls, together with the break-even point that we discussed. Okay. So basically, this is just a summary of the metrics or the approaches that we have talked about. And this is what 
Track is using. So when, let's say, you, from your CR, you want to submit a search system. You are doing some new research. You came up with an algorithm. The track comes up with some test collections. They say, this year, this is the document collection we will be using. And these are the queries we will be running. They give you the queries. You run your search system on the document collection they provide. You retrieve rank list of document, then track your document IDs. Then track uses this type of an approach to evaluate the quality of your system and sends back the result and announces the top performing systems that year. Okay, that, so that's what happens in track. So now we have a bunch of different components in creating these test collections, how does track create these test collections? So, okay, so that later on you can come up with your own test collection if you are interested in, for example, searching medical documents. Okay? There are three things that you should think about. What corpus am I going to use? Cor corpus meaning document collection. What queries am I going to use? And what type of judgments? Which document? On which documents am I going to obtain these judgments? And how many assessments will be judging each document? Okay, so these are the things that we will be talk about, talking about now. Let's have a look at how Trek does these things. So at the beginning, when Trek started, they were really using tiny size document collections. Okay, so Trek has been around for many, many different years, and the number of documents that they were using was really quite few. Now these documents are really basically irrelevant. Okay, at the time, it was really difficult to search using this document collection. That's why they were using it. But what happened is, over time, now we are using much bigger document collections. Okay, and uh, everything in this basically is now irrelevant. Okay, so in the 1970s, the commercial systems would be just searching hundreds of thousands of documents. This is just something trivial. Now what we are doing uh, right now is basically just millions in 1990s we would use we would be searching millions of documents and now the web is like billions of documents so the latest collection latest test collections that are provided by track basically also scale uh, uh, they follow the scale of the change in time meaning now the document collections they provide are in size of terabytes they try to basically just uh, follow the speed of the growth in web. <coughs> so the latest web collection they provide is really, really big. You would need a cluster or a big system to index that and to create a search system that can run on that. Okay? So at the beginning, the individual groups weren't really able to produce test collections at sufficient scale. The reason for that is, even though these collections, the document collections were kind of small, there is still a lot of cost behind constructing these test collections. You have to hire people to label documents as relevant and non-relevant to your query. Okay? For example, for commercial search engine companies, every year they spend millions of dollars just to hire people. They, these people sit there and label documents as relevant and non-relevant to a query. That's their goal. And Trek also has access to this system. Okay? So the, the, the American government, the US government, funds this system, and they hire some people, and these people really sit there, do the judging, provide the test collection to the academic research community. So we have standard tools that we, or and standard benchmark data that we can use to evaluate the quality of our system. Here is the cost, the total amount of money spent by track, this is in thousands of dollars, so it's more like millions of dollars, basically. Okay, as you can see, it's a significant amount of money. So the U.S. government really spent quite a bit of money on this, and the, the reason was at the beginning they really understood that searching and finding relevant information is something that is needed. Basically, track is hosted by NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, and uh, their goal which is like more government organization, and their goal is really just to make sure the American, the U.S. government, or the researchers in the U.S. are up to date with the, with the industry, and they can really do this type of stuff very well using this type of budget. But it's very difficult for us in academia and in other parts of the world, especially, to come up with collections like this scale or to spend this much of money. 
So this is really a very big contribution to the research community. Okay? And uh, at the beginning, what they did was they were just using articles. Okay? So let's say, okay, track has different tasks. What I mean by tasks or tracks, what I mean by this is, for example, one track or one task in, in track is to evaluate the quality of uh, interactive interactive retrieval systems when there is some user interaction. Another task or another track is to evaluate quality of blog retrieval systems and so on. Okay, so there are a bunch of different tasks or goals. Track provides different collections specific to each of these tasks. And one such goal is to uh, evaluate the quality of web retrieval. At the beginning, Track didn't have, or wasn't using web documents. What they did was they would just use articles like news journals or government agencies articles, and they would just provide test collections, building this document collection, and ask people to submit their runs, assuming that these collections would have properties similar to the web, okay? Which is completely wrong. But during the last few years, they have changed this assumption. Now they are we are really working on web scale data and real web data sets. So if you're interested, just go to the track data, track website, and you can find all the information on how you can get this data set and so on. So the latest collection that I talked about is the Clue Web Collection, which was crawled, which is the crawl of the web in, from 2009, okay? And they, they have downloaded almost all the web, except they get rid of some spam pages based on the page rank scores that you have already seen. So it's a significant fraction of web, okay? And uh, and uh, you can just get it if you're, if, you're, if you're interested, but you have to pay a little bit, although it's publicly available to everyone in academia, okay? So like I said, there are a bunch of different uh, collections like blog, track, Twitter track. They all have test collections that contain blogs or Twitter data and so on. So if you're interested in, for example, Twitter, you can just go and have a look at the related subtask, related track tab, and you will find a test collection specifically designed for Twitter search, and you can download that collection, and you can do your research on that. Okay, so it's quite useful for us. Okay, and there are many other platforms in Europe that basically, that were modeled after track. They just copied the ideas from track so that for example, people in Europe also are up to date with the, with the research uh, that is done in track and so on. So this was the corpus part. Now the second question is what query? So what does track do? At the beginning, what track was doing is these are people who are retired information analysts. These are the judges that are used by track. These are the ones who create those test collections. Okay. So these people would look at the document collection, they are looking at the documents there, and they would come up with a bunch of different queries just by looking at the collection, okay? And then Czech would just gather these queries constructed by these different information analysts, and they would say, okay, these are the queries that we will be using this year. Are they not here Sorry? Uh, what, what, what are they people? These are retired information analysts. <laughs> the money there that I show, most of them is spent on paying them. Yeah. So in the color part is that in university people normally hire students. <laughs> okay, so the way they would come up with these topics was basically first search collection for potential topics like I talked about and then they would remove topics or queries that return for example too many relevant documents or too few relevant documents or that appear ambiguous to the to themselves for example it's not clear what the query is talking about but the information is behind the query okay and here is how a, a query in track in the early days of track looks like so you have the number of the query then you have the title, the topic, okay? Then you have a brief description, like the, the topic or the query is the fact of foreign textile imports on US textile industry. 
Then you have a description of that. And finally, you have a narrative that describes what exactly should be relevant, considered relevant, and what exactly should be considered non-relevant. So the first step in constructing the test collections in check was to come up with this. And then this would be shown to these assessors that we talked about. They would use this as a guideline to do the judging. Okay? So the main problem with this approach is none of these queries come from real users. Okay? Also, in quite a few cases, the same query may mean completely different thing. When you give the user a narrative, you are restricting the person on a particular aspect of relevance for that query. Okay? So ideally, what should happen is these queries should come from real users, from real users. So now, in the last few years, we are really, track is, has changed that during the last three years or so. They are now using queries taken from query logs. They are using, for example, search engines like Bing. They come up with an algorithm to get rid of head and tail parts of the query log distribution in these search engines. And then they do some sampling, and they use these real queries that come from real users as, as the queries that are used. So now, the third part is we have, let's say, the ideal way to, uh, to get these queries was to just sample <coughs> queries from real usage data based on some previous query logs. Now, how do we get the judgments? Okay. So first of all, as we talked about at the beginning, all these judgments were binary. The people would, would be asked to do some judging, and they would just judge each document as relevant or not relevant. Later on, they started being having different levels of relevance. You can see here in 2010 map track the different levels of relevance that people have that, that were used in judging. So you have first category nav. This is a navigational URL. And this is the only and most relevant result to this, to this query. Or key, this page is really very relevant to this query. Hydral is slightly less relevant than the key one, but still contains quite a bit of relevant information. Relevant, it is somehow relevant, but not really ideal. Non-relevant, <coughs> completely off, and junk, like irrelevant. Completely irrelevant, and not something that you want to show to people, for example. Okay, so th these are the different relevance grades that, that were used in 2010, and commercial search companies use more or less in the uh, judgment grade that are in the same lines as this. And uh, basically, Trek actually kind of adopted the strategy used by commercial search engine companies for this. Now, the, the second, the fourth component in judging is how many documents should be judged per topic. Okay. One thing we talked about is we have this metric here. The metric gets the relevance of documents judged for the query, and we evaluate the quality of our system using this metric. And as we said, since our system, the quality of the system, highly depends on recall, we need to have identified all the documents, all the documents that are relevant to the query in our entire document collection, which would require judging the entire document collection. Okay. So this is impossible, right? We have to come up with an efficient with, uh, and with a cheaper method of doing this. But then there is the question of course versus reliability here. So I would like to reduce the cost of judging the documents. I would like to judge less documents. At the same time, I would like to make sure that the evaluations that I obtain with these judgments are reliable, meaning they represent something meaningful, OK? So that's one problem. And what happens in track, and again, this is a quite, this almost a standard approach used in many, many different places, like commercial search engine companies, to reduce the number of judgments needed is basically what is called depth pooling. Okay? So in track, you have a bunch of different systems submitted for the conference. These are the systems that are competing with each other, and your goal is to find the top perform performing one. You run each of these systems on a query. You have already identified these queries. Oops, sorry. And then all these different systems retrieve, retrieve some documents in the collection. So in the end, if you have M systems that you would like to compare 
with each other, you have m different length, length list. Now you have to pick which documents you should be judging to evaluate the quality of these rank lists, but you have to do it efficiently. But track downs is what I call depth K pooling, which is instead of labeling everything in the document, but track assumes that documents that are retrieved in the top K of at least one of the search engines have the possibility to be relevant. If a document is not retrieved in top K of any of the systems, then that document is likely to be non-relevant. Okay, so that's the main assumption behind that K pooling. So then what track does is just labels these documents in top K as the assessors to label the documents retrieved in top K. Okay, so now the, the judging is done. There are some documents like this one that is retrieved lower than K, but because it has appeared somewhere else, like as the second document uh, in system one, they will still get judgments, which is fine. And these are the documents that were not retrieved in top K by any of the systems, so we will assume that they are just non-relevant. Okay, so that's the main approach used by track. And the K value there is oftentimes, it depends on the task really, but usually track uses the hundred tools. Okay? In the case of web search, these are much shallower. They use step 10 or something like that. But this is the main idea. There are a few things that you should, uh, you should be careful about here. Here, we are highly depending on the fact that we have various number of different systems that are submitted to our, our competition, our track conference. What I mean by that is, I'm, let's say I'm, I'm evaluating the quality of this system. One thing we said was that I should be able to identify relevant documents that this system failed to retrieve because it's important to compute recall components. Now, because I have access to a variety of different systems, what I'm assuming is that even though this system may fail to retrieve that document, that relevant document, some of these systems will retrieve it at the top. Okay? So it's really important to make sure you have access to a variety of different systems so that at least one of them will be retrieving a relevant, one of these relevant documents that you fail to retrieve. Okay, so now we have obtained the relevance judgments. Now we would like to use those judgments, I have the judgments now, to evaluate the quality of these systems. I use an evaluation metric, this could be average precision and DCG and so on, and I report the results. And now I should do it over many different queries so that I am not just depending so, too much or giving too much weight on evaluations on a particular query. So this process is, a, is repeated over many different queries. Oftentimes 50 queries were used, but now we are using much bigger query sets, even in tracks, like thousands of documents. And at the end, the mean quality across different queries is reported as the final quality of your system. Okay, so that's how the tracks, uh, track test construction methodology works, which forms the basis <coughs> of constructing test collections in many different search companies. Okay, kind of a standard approach. Okay, so the main idea behind the 100 pooling was that in small collections, at the beginning, the collections were really, really small. They show that even if you miss some relevant documents, because you may still miss to identify some relevant documents, they didn't affect so much the ranking of systems. So it was fine. Now we have much bigger problem, much bigger collections, so it's a little bit more problematic. And uh, in larger, and in larger collections. As I said, people, uh, the pooling method is somehow inadequate to find all the interesting relevant documents. One more problem was the step 100 pooling, even though it is useful to reduce number of judgments needed, it really was still kind of expensive. Okay, for example, in track one to eight test collections, which are really small test collections, that they only had 50 topics. Okay, and using that 100 pools, so uh, if you compute step 100 pools over the system submitted to track that year, 
you would obtain 73,000 different judgments. Okay, you would have to judge 73,000 different documents. And if you use 30 seconds to judge each document, then that this would take 75 labor days. Okay, this is just non-stop. Okay, then um, this really becomes a big problem if you have more queries or if you have much bigger document collections. Then now the second question here: How many is how many assessors should you have for the document? As we said, each document is labeled by one relevant assessor. But the system, the people that judge these documents, they may have different notions of relevance. What I think is relevant may not be exactly the same as what you think is relevant. <coughs> and people really showed that different people have different notions of relevance. But what they also showed that vari variation in assessments or variation in, in these judgments didn't really affect the ranking of the systems. So the goal that we have here is to make sure we rank the systems in a correct way so we can understand what is which system is better than the other. The judgments themselves on document level may be different, may vary from person to person, but when you evaluate the quality of your system, when you use these judgments to evaluate the quality of system, it doesn't make that much of a difference. Okay? Furthermore, it was also shown that the expertise of a, top, of a person on a topic may make a difference, okay? We won't talk about that now, but because of the first result, what TREC did it, they just used one assessor to judge each document, rather than using multiple assessors. Okay, now, how many documents should we judge? We go back to the uh, first question that we asked. As we said, recall is important and it's very difficult to identify uh, these documents, relevant documents, quickly and in a cheap manner. And like we said, even if you use approaches like the hundred pools, it still takes a lot of time to judge the documents in your that hundred pool. Okay, so you still need a lot of time. And furthermore, you need a lot of money to judge. So even if you use that 100 post, it still costs you a lot of money. What you have to do is, ideally, now that our collections have become bigger, like web, and now that we want to be able to evaluate our system on many different queries, we want a, a mechanism that can enable us to reduce this cost of judging documents, okay? So instead of judging entire that 100 full, I want to be able to do something smarter so I, it can cost, it still can cost me a lot less money and a lot less time. This is the thing that people have been trying to do lately because, again, search engine companies, the big ones, they have money, they can spend millions of dollars on this, but they don't have the time. They don't want to wait, okay? Each time they build a new test collection, they are immediately tuning their system on that collection and so on, and their new system may be overfitting to their new test collection. They have to get rid of these queries once they optimize their system on that, get new queries, new test collection, and so on. So they have to continuously obtain judgments, obtain new test collections. So they have to do it in an efficient manner. And people in academia like us or in small search engine companies, they neither have the time nor the money. So it's really important for both ends to be able to do this process efficiently. So what people have done was, okay, yes, our metrics depend on the judgments, but what if these judgments were missing? If I didn't have all the judgments, if my judgments were incomplete, would my metrics be still act reliably? How much would they deviate from their original values? And it was shown that if you were to remove some judgments, if your judgments become more and more incomplete, meaning you don't judge some documents, you only judge some selected ones, then your results, your evaluation results, will start diverging from the actual results. You will get false results, basically. So here, for example, if this is the actual rank list of documents that we have, the blue ones could be the ones that we have the judgments for. These are the ones for which we don't have labels, okay? Depending on <coughs> the judgments, the actual judgments of the ones that we don't have labels for, 
the quality of this ranking will really change a lot and you may reach some false conclusions depending on those rankings. So people came up with new metrics that can incorporate incompleteness in judgments and they are, that are kind of more robust to this incompleteness in judgments. One such metric is BPREF, okay? which is, as you can see, it looks kind of similar to average precision. Here, R is the number of relevant documents in the entire document collection. And over all relevant documents in the rank list, the rele judge relevant documents, because some documents will be unjudged in this scenario, over all judge relevant documents, you count the number of non-relevant documents above this relevant document and divide it by the total number of relevant documents. Okay, so this is the idea behind BPREF. One thing I would like to say is there is no real um, mechanisms that you can use to infer this, neither user model, exact user model, nor like an approximation to something that we talked about. So it's a bit ad hoc. The main reason why they designed it is because it's correlated with average precision if you have all the judgments available. <coughs> and once your judgments become more and more incomplete, BPREF is more robust to these incompleteness in judgments than average precision. Okay? So this is one of the metrics that are that is uh, provided to you in track eval. If you run it, it will give you BPREF value as well because your collection there may also be incomplete. It is, BPREF is more robust uh, to incomplete judgments than standard metrics, and it is highly correlated with average precision when your judgments are complete. So it is still doing something reasonable because it is correlated with average precision when your judgments are complete. It's a, it's a reasonable metric. But what happens is, the value of BPREF deviates from the value of average precision when the judgments become more and more incomplete. So what you see here is, on the x-axis, you have actual average precision computed using somehow completely judged document collection. Okay? And on the y-axis, what we have is, we sample some documents from the completely judged collection, assume these documents are judged, the rest of the documents are unjudged, okay? So here on the y-axis, we have been pre-evaluated on the 5% judged sample of the complete document collection. And we also have the line y equals x, and you can see that the value of BPREF really started deviating from the value of average precision based on the root mean squared error. Okay, so the value is off. And also candle star metric. So how many of you know what candle star metric is? So candle star means the following. Okay? So in information retrieval, what we care about is if I'm comparing one ranking to another, or one ranking of systems to another ranking of systems, what I care about is when I pick two systems from this ranking, are they in correct order or not? Okay? So my goal is in this entire evaluation scenario is to make sure I rank the systems in a correct manner, okay? So because that's what I want to do really. I want to get the top performing system, for example. So what Candle Star does is it computes a correlation between two different ranking of systems. What it says is if I per, if I were to pick a pair of systems from my ranking at random. What is the probability that this pair of systems would be ranked in correct order? Is it clear? So it's basically like a probability value. And it gives you the probability that this BPREF metric will rank these systems in correct order. And you can see, by using 5% sample, I have 80% probability also that my systems will be ranked in correct order which is still low because the threshold that most people use on the top correlation is like 0.9. Now we also have the linear correlation coefficient there. The B is, is uh, overestimated. Yes, mostly, yes. Okay, uh, why is it robust? Uh, is it overestimated? This? So it's be, uh, be less robust if it's overestimated. Because if you have a missing random data, then for 
MAP would be lower than the original one? Or? No, what it is doing is the, the reason why it's higher here is it's basically ignoring the ones that are just uh, unjudged. Okay. So those documents could be relevant <coughs> or not relevant. When you are ignoring them, you are making sure they are everything get posted up. Okay. And uh, that's why it's overestimated. Okay. So one approach to evaluation with incomplete judgments, again, this is commonly used by commercial companies still, is Suppose I have judgments only on these documents, still but unjudged. I can just ignore these unjudged documents, form a consensus on the judged documents, now evaluate the quality of my system. Very simple. And then evaluate it using average precision and so on. And uh, basically this, you can, by some mathematical uh, formulation, you can show that doing this is actually very similar to computing BPRES somehow. It's slightly different. If you were to compute average precision in this condensed set, basically we are computing something approximately equal to BPREF, okay, except it's a little bit better or more reliable than BPREF. Okay? But it still has the same problems as BPREF because the value of this approach, the metric, again deviates. So here on the right hand side, I have on x axis actual AP, y axis, this induced metric that I talked about, which is obtained by removing these unjudged documents. On the left, we have actual AP versus BPREF. You can see that this one is better, actually, the induced AP, but still, the value is not really a very good approximation to actual average precision, because the values are way off from line by into sex. So now, given this problem, this problem suggests that we cannot really compute these judgments, don't compute these evaluation metrics with incomplete judgments. We have to do something smarter than we evaluate our system. So we have to be able to estimate the value of our metrics with less judgments, okay? And what we will talk about now is instead of finding these hacky ways of uh, just trying to compute the values of these metrics, why don't we use the ideas from sampling theory, okay? So what happens in sampling is, like think about election polls actually. It's very similar idea. In election polls, let's say I want to see in next elections whether Obama will win or not. I don't have the luxury to ask everyone whether they think they will vote for Obama or not. What I would do normally is to ask a sample of people whether they will vote for Obama or not get these judgments, aggregate these some judgments somehow, and use statistical estimation techniques to estimate uh, the fraction of people that will vote for Obama. Okay, it's basically exactly the same idea here. I want to understand whether the quality of this system is better than the other one. I cannot judge all the documents that would re be required to evaluate the quality of system. Instead, I will just get a sample of these documents, have them judge, use statistical estimation techniques then to evaluate the quality of my system and estimate the value of my evaluation metric. And this way, because I'm using techniques from statistics, my estimates for the value of the metric will be unbiased. Okay? So I'll talk about how we will do that in a bit. But let's start again from the beginning. So let's consider a population of 1,000 animals, a percentage of which is sick. It's the same idea as this voting example that I talked about. And I want to find the percentage of sick animals. One obvious solution is to examine all 1,000 documents and return number of sick divided by 1,000. But if it is expensive to do this examination, what I can do instead is to uniformly sample these animals, <coughs> examine the sampled animals, and return number of 16 divided by number of sampled documents, sampled animals in this case. Okay? So that's the main idea that we will be using for the evaluation scenario as well. We have the DEF 100 or DEF K pools. Normally we would be labeling all the documents in this pool, that's what's required, but we don't have the budget to label all of them, what we will do instead is we will sample some documents from this 
that careful or that ponderful, we will get these sample documents and we will give them, sorry, to our judge. And our judge will be only labeling the sample documents. There will be some documents that for which the judgments will be missing. Okay? Now, in the second step now, I will use these sample documents to evaluate the quality of my systems. So, the idea behind using these sample documents to evaluate the quality of retrieval system and to form unbiased estimates of evaluation metrics is based on defining a measure as an outcome of a random experiment. So, for example, I would like to evaluate, compute the value of average precision metric using this incomplete judge, judge set obtained by sampling. Okay? I have to first define average precision as a random experiment. We will see how to do this in a bit. And then estimate this outcome of this random experiment using random sampling. Okay? So in our case, we know that the incomplete judgments are a random sample drawn from the set of complete judgments because I, I use a uniform sampling approach. So I can just use this random sample to estimate the output of my outcome for the random experiment. Let's see how we do that. First, let's start with a simple evaluation metric, like precision at 5, let's say. And then we will go to average precision, a little bit more complicated. So again, first we should use, we should define our evaluation matrix as random experiments. I claim precision at 5 corresponds to the following random experiment. First step is to select the rank at random from the set 1 to k, or 1 to 5, if I'm doing precision at 5. Second step is to output the binary relevance of the document at this rank I selected. Okay. Now let's see as an example, using an example, why precision at 5 corresponds to expectation of this random experiment. Let's assume that I have this rank list of documents, and let's compute the expected value of this random experiment. The first step of my random experiment says, select the rank at random from the set 1 to k. Okay, I'm computing precision at 5. So I select the documents at random from set 1 to 5. They all have equal probability of selected, being selected, 1 over 5. Okay, so I'm done. I am I have done the first step. With probability 1 over 5, I could pick the first document. 1 over 5, second document, and so on. Now the second step is to output the binary relevant relevance of the documents at the rank that you selected. Okay? So with probability 1 over 5, I could select the first document, whose relevance is 1. With probability 1 over 5, I could select the second document at the first step, relevance 1. 1 over 5, I could select the third document, whose relevance is 0, and so on. Okay? Now, as you can see, when I compute the expectation of this process, at the end, I have obtained exactly precision at 5. Is this clear? Okay, so now, this is assuming that I have all the judgments available. We didn't get into the estimation part yet. First, we are talking about defining metrics as random experiments. And once we have, since we have just defined this, let's move on to defining average precision <coughs> as a random experiment as well. So remember, average precision was average of precision as relevant documents. Okay? I claim that average precision corresponds to this random experiment. The first step is select the relevant document, uh, re relevant document at random from our rank list of documents. Okay. Let the rank of this document be k. <coughs> Second step is to select a rank at random from the set 1 to k. So what I'm doing now is I have selected a relevant document at random from my rank list. Now I'm selecting any document at or above this rank, the rank with which this document is retrieved. So I'm looking at all the documents retrieved above this. I'm randomly selecting another one. Okay? And now the third step is output the binary relevance of the document that I have now selected in the second step. Okay? So what I'm doing here is, by selecting a relevant document at random, 
I am actually computing the average and in second step second and third I am computing the precision at the at these relevant documents. Okay? So I'm basically essentially computing average of precision at relevant documents. Is this clear? So let's have a look again using an example. So we can compute the expected, expected value of this random experiment and it becomes clear that it really is average precision. So again, first step of our random experiment is to select the relevant document at random. So here in my list, there are four relevant documents. I could select any one of them with equal probability. So with probability one over four, since I have four, I could select this one, one over four, this one, or this one, or this one. Okay? So that's the first step. Now, once I selected the relevant document, the second step is to select the rank at random from rank 1 to k. So assume that I selected this relevant document in the first step. The rank of this, uh, this relevant document is 4. Now in the second step, I could select any of these documents that are above this relevant document. Okay? And let's assume that then I selected this one and I just output the binary relevance of this. So what is the expected outcome of this now? One thing is, the second and third steps of this random experiment, does it remind you of something we just talked about? So look at the random experiment corresponding to precision. Okay, look at the random experiment corresponding to average precision. They are the same, right? The second and third steps are almost the same. So in second and third steps of this process, I'm just computing precision at k. Because it's exactly the same random experiment. Okay? So now, to compute the expected output of this random experiment, yeah, I start from the beginning. First, I select the relevant document at random. With probability 1 over 4, I could select the very first relevant document. And the second and third steps of my random experiment basically computes the expected precision in this in this rank, which is one at this point. Or with probability one over four, I could select the second relevant document, at which point the precision is again one. With probability one over four, I could select the third one, and the precision at that point is three over four, or the last one, and the precision is four over eight. So you see this is exactly the same as computing the average of precision at relevant documents. So it's, they are identical. Okay, so this is the random experiment that corresponds to average precision. You can apply this idea for different evaluation metrics. It doesn't have to be this one. Okay, this is a very general idea. So now, given that we have defined our matrix as random experiments, how can we estimate the value of our evaluation metrics, when our judgments are incomplete, how can we use this idea? Okay? So, what we will do is, we will use this random experiment, okay? And we will use our sample documents to estimate the output of this random experiment. That's how the random experiment helps us, okay? So the first step of our random experiment was to select the relevant document at random. I don't have now access to all the relevant documents in the collection because I only have a random sample of them judged. Okay? So now, given that I have only a random sample of them judge, judged, because these, ju these judged documents are selected uniformly at random to be judged, the distribution between the re judged relevant documents in my collection is uniform. Okay? So, since I have uniform sample, I have uniform distribution over the relevant documents that are judged. Okay? So I could just pick any one of the relevant documents that are judged in my small labeled collection. Is this clear? So that's the first step of my random experiment. Now the second step tells me, second and third steps is to compute the expected precision at a relevant document at rank K. These were the second and third steps. So at this point, 
What I am doing is I'm picking a document at or above the current rank. Current rank of the document that I selected at the first stage. And I'm outputting the binary relevance of that document. Okay? Again, I have the same problem. I don't have the judgments for all the documents retrieved above this rank. So what I will use is I will use an estimate for the proportion for the uh, proportion of relevant to non-relevant documents to compute this expected precision at the relevant document at rank A. So what I can do at this point is I have a bunch of different documents, let's say. This is the uh, unknown. So these are all documents that for which judgments are unknown. Let's say at the first step, I sample this one. Okay. Now I would like to compute the expected precision at this point. Okay. So now, the second and third steps of my random experiment tells me select a rank at random from the set 1 to k. I can select any of the ranks at random from this set from here to here, 1 to k. Okay. And then I will be outputting the binary relevance of the document that I have selected. Okay, now, so at the first step, I know that this document is relevant because I have already selected it at the first step. Okay? So with probability 1 over k, I could select this document during this second and third steps of the experiment, whose relevance is 1. Yeah? Or with probability k minus 1 over k, I could select any of these documents and I have to estimate now the expected binary relevance of the document that I selected because there are some unjudged documents here. Okay? So how do I do this estimation? Basically just computing exactly in the case of sick proportion of sick animals out of the K minus one documents that I have, well how many of them are relevant in here? Okay? So that gives me an estimate for the expected number of or expected fraction of the relevant documents. Okay? So that's exactly what we have here. At rank K, with probability 1 over K, I could select the current document, which I know is relevant because it's selected at first step, or with probability K minus 1 over K, I could select a document above this current document for which I have to estimate the precision. Okay? And how do I estimate the precision? By just computing the fraction of judge relevant documents, the total number of judge documents within the top K minus one documents. Any questions about this? Let's have a look now at this to see whether it really works. So this is our rank list of documents. And if I were to compute actual average precision for this system, I would get this value. Okay? It starts from here to here. Now, how can we use this metric, this approach that we just described, which is called inferred AP, to compute, to estimate the value of average precision for this system if I only had these documents judged? Okay? So, again, let's think about the random experiment. The first step of the random experiment was telling us select a relevant document at random from your rank list. Okay? So now I have three relevant documents. With probability 1 over 3, I could be selecting any of these relevant documents. Let's assume that with probability 1 over 3, I selected the first one. The second and third steps of my random experiment tell me selected that document at or above this, at or above this document that I selected and output the binary relevance of the, of the document, that you, the new document that you select. So I'm at rank 1 with probability 1 over 1. Sorry. I could select the current document whose relevance is 1. And there are no documents above, so there is no way I could select anything above it. Now, with probability 1 over 3, I could select the second relevant document. Now I have to compute the expected precision at, at this point, at this relevant document. So this document is retrieved at rank 4. The second step of my random experiment tells me select a document at or above this current rank 
So with probability one over four, I could select the document that is the strength with relevance is one. What probability three over four, I could select the document above this current document. And for them, I don't have judgments for some of them. So I have to estimate the expected precision or expected binary relevance of the document that I will be selecting. Okay? So what is my estimate for the expected binary relevance of the document I will be selecting? I can estimate that using the judgments that I have. So out of two documents that are already judged, one of them is relevant. So the expected binary relevance I will observe is one over two. Okay? I continue this process. With probability one over three, I could select this one. And again, the same process. I'm not repeating it again. Let me know if you want me to repeat it. So basically, in the end, I just compute the expected precision across the different relevant documents. And at the end, you can see that even though I don't have quite a few documents just here, the estimate that I have here is very close to the actual value of the metric that I have computed. And in fact, if you plot this for many different systems, you can see that really the values that you obtain using this type of approach are right on line by equal meaning they are unbiased estimates of the actual values of metrics. Okay? So these are the similar plots as before. On the x-axis, we have the actual value of the matrix using 100% sample, assuming everything is judged as much as we can. On the y-axis, we have the values of matrix computed using 10% sample. You can see that things like BPREF deviate from actual values. But in the AP, okay, there is some variance in our estimate, but in general, it tends to be around the line by equal sex. So the estimates are unbiased. And these are, again, some other comparisons. I'll skip them. Okay. So until now, we talked about cost versus reliability. How can you reduce cost? And uh, so you can make some results reliable. Now I will talk about the reliability in averaging in the, in the values, metric values that we talked about. Let's assume that we have all the judgments available. Okay. We evaluate the quality of system, we, we average the quality of system across a bunch of different queries, we compare the, that average value with another system. Can I reliably say if the average value that I have obtained for this system is higher than the other one, that this system is really better than, than, than the other? Okay? That's the question that we will ask now. So I have a, a bunch of different retrieval systems here. In, uh, 604, these are names of systems submitted to track. That's why they have these strange names. There are tiny codes for them. Here, x axis are different queries. Okay? And uh, the red lines here are the mean performance across all the different queries. So, the mean performance, the average performance across different queries for first system is 0 0.281, second one is 0 0.324. And third one is 0 0.373. Okay. Now the question is, can you really say, given that this system seems to have the best value for average precision, can you really say that this system is the best system among the three, three of these? Like, if you were to have new queries, if you were to run this system on new coming queries that you didn't use here, can you really say? that this system will probably again do much better than the others. Any ideas? We, we could look at the distribution. And how? Well, the, to compute the, uh, the standard deviation of the, uh, of this, uh, of the, of the, of the difference to the mean. Uh -huh. Yes. Something like that, and that. So, and that gives us a notion of the uh, of the variance of whether a system mm -hmm. behaves how how differently a system behaves mm -hmm. in different settings. Yes. Yeah. 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 Ye
So how stable the... Yes, the you are going in the correct direction, yes. Basically what you are trying to do now is to understand really whether the mean is highly affected by some abnormal behavior in some of the queries. I'll show you some examples about that. Or whether really this system in general tends to behave better than the others. Okay, I'll show you an example of systems. For example, in here you can see one system. Okay? So you can see that this purple one, if you compute the average, it looks really much better than the others. But uh, normally, as you can see for most of the queries, it is not really doing that well. Okay, actually, based on this, you should say that it's worse than the other systems, probably. Okay, so how we can make sure we can trust on these mean values that we compute that they will generalize to other unseen queries is by using what is called significance test. Okay, so I'll skip this part. There are a bunch of different reasons why your results may be not as reliable as you like. There may be variance in your results. But let's focus on how you can evaluate this. And you can say that with this probability, this system is really better than the other. OK? So our goal is to really understand that we observe a difference in effectiveness scores across two systems. I would like to say, does this difference just occur by random chance? Or it is just really, for unseen systems, we can really say that with very high probability, this system will still be doing better than the other one. So for this, like I said, we'll be using significance tests. And the significance test estimates the probability P of observing a certain difference in effectiveness, given that our null hypothesis, A0, is true, okay? So, depending on the scenario that you will be using significance test for, your A0, your null hypothesis, could be different, okay? So, the significance tests are really very generic things. You can use it for many different tests. Depending on the test, your null hypothesis will be different. In IR evaluation, our null hypothesis, A0, is that two different systems are in effect the same. They have the same quality, okay? That's what we would like to basically validate or invalidate. And because these are systems, uh, uh, overall kind of equal to each other, whatever difference you observe in their performance is just due to random chance. That's our null hypothesis H0, okay? One important thing, whatever kind of research or whatever kind of thing you do, if you are working with samples, like we are working here, in order to conclude that what you are doing is better than some previous approach, you have to run significance tests. If you are working with a sample, this is not special to IR evaluation, in machine learning, in anything that you can think of. If you don't run a significance test, you can never trust that your results are really true or they are, they are not affected by this randomness in, in the sample that you have. Okay, so you definitely have to run a significance test. And in fact, if you write a paper without putting these results in, just by reporting the mean values, your paper will probably not get in. Okay, so what is our significance testing framework? We have two hypotheses, RH0. In the case of, again, IR evaluation, the standard H0 is the mean is different. This is the mean the difference between the mean performance of the systems. Okay, so I have system one, system two. If they are equal to each other in performance, the difference between the mean performance should be zero. That's my null hypothesis. And my alternative hypothesis is that the mean difference is not zero. Okay, so what I have done is the system performance measurement over a sample of different topics. And I will be using these sample measurements to understand whether I can reject <coughs> X0 or not. Okay? So what the, the way I will do is I will compute the test statistic T. We'll talk about different test statistics now. And we will, I will be using the distribution of test statistic to compute a P value, which will give me the probability of sampling P 
from a distribution obtained by assuming a series proof. Okay? So, using my evidence, which is the sample that I have, I will be computing a p-value, which is just the probability of sampling this that I have, the test statistic, from a distribution obtained by assuming that the mean performance is different. Let's see what that means in a bit. But first, let's talk about what these tests are. One of the commonly used tests is the student's t test. I'm sure you have heard of it if you have taken statistics. Okay? So it's a parametric test. What it means is you are using the scores of systems. The test metric is using the scores of systems. And the assumptions are, like I said, because you are using score values, because it's parametric, the assumptions are that the effectiveness score differences are meaningful, because you are using scores in the test metric, in the t-test value. And the effectiveness difference scores follow a normal distribution. Okay? And the test statistic value is basically this one. You just compute the difference in performance across a bunch of different queries and you perform the mean of that, divided by the standard deviation of the performance differences, and multiply it by square root of n. Okay? And it was also shown that, yes, this normally the assumption is a problem, because in some cases, the data is just not normal distribution, but it was shown that it still does quite well, even if your data is not normal distributed. Here's an example on how you can compute the student's t-test. So I have a bunch of different queries. I have the metric value for system A and for system B. First, I compute the difference between my metric values. This could be average precision or any other metric. So this is my B minus A. Okay. Then I can compute the average over all these values. Okay. This is my B minus A average. And then I also compute the standard deviation across these values. And I multiply it with how many observations, or many observations I have. Okay? Now what, the, what I obtain from this is a t value, okay? The value of the statistic. And then given this t value, oftentimes you have the student's t table that can give you the probability that you would obtain this type of t value, if your hypothesis H0 was true, okay? So your hypothesis H0 was that the mean performance of the systems are not different than each other. They are the same, okay? So the p value would be, will give you the probability that you would obtain this t value if that null hypothesis was really true, okay? Then based on this now, you can say that with this probability, so now, this t, the, based on the observations I have, this really comes from the, H0, uh, the distribution for which H0 is true. That's how you can do the significance test. And we'll talk about what this p value means and how to set, set this in a bit. Another, number, another significance test, the sign test, this is a non-parametric one, meaning it doesn't depend on scores, it only depends on ranks of documents retrieved. Okay, and the null hypothesis for the test is that the two systems, the probability that one system is better than the other is the same as the probability that the other one is better. So they are equally good. Okay, that's our null hypothesis. And our test statistic now is the number of pairs where one system is better than the other. So it's a rather simple test statistic. But then I'm not getting to details. Another non-parametric one, is the Wilcoxon sign RAM test, okay? So, which is basically, you just compute the sign rank of absolute differences. I'll show you in a bit what that means, okay? And now you just compute these RI values. So, as an example, again, I have one rank this, another rank this. I just compute the, the differences in performance for each query, B minus A. I sort these these differences in, a, in terms of absolute value, okay? And then I assign a signed rank to all these sorted values, okay? 
Okay. So whatever the value of the difference is, the sign of the difference is, the sorted value gets the same sign. Okay. And the values are just uh, assigned some rank <coughs> based on their sorted absolute values. Okay. So finally, the final statistic that I have is just the sum of these sign rank values. Okay, now, one, just one last thing I want, I briefly want to talk about is, in hypothesis testing, there are really two types of errors. Okay, this is the last thing that I would like to talk about. One of them is the probability that given H0 is false, you will incorrectly say, you will basically say that H0 is actually true, okay? And the other one is, given H0 is true, you will incorrectly say that it should be false. Okay? Different types of errors. These are called type 1 and type 2 errors. Okay? So let's have a look at type 1 error. Okay? Type 1 error is basically kind of modeled by this p value that we talked about. Okay? So we said that given that H0 is Given the value of this test statistic, p value gives us the probability that we would observe this value if a0 is true. Okay? So basically, in type 1 error, what we are doing exactly is to set the error that you would make when you infer this. Okay? And oftentimes, what will happen is you will give, you will be given an alpha value that will dictate the error, the type 1 error that you are allowed to make, and then based on this value that you are given, you can just conclude whether really two systems are different than each other or not, for example. Okay? So if you want to be really, really sure that the quality of systems are different than each other, then you can set this value to a very, very small value. So you are really, really sure that the difference is significant, or you can set it to a different, a larger value if it is okay to make some errors, some type 1 errors. Okay? There is also what is called the type 2 error rate. I won't get into that because I know we are running a bit late, I think. But uh, this is just something that you should keep in mind. It exists. It is not as commonly used as type 1 error rate. Okay? This is the rate of the, what is called power of significance set. It will be in the slide if you want to have a look. Okay? So basically, as a conclusion, we talked about evaluation metrics, online offline evaluation, test connection construction, and significance test. Okay? So if you have any questions about any of these, I'm happy to answer them now, or the, you can also contact your professor on me directly. Okay, and I'm going to answer any of questions we have now as well. Yeah, I think it's, it's already part my part because it's past five. We can do the questioning now. We can do the questioning, you know, offline. You, you have any questions? You can come along. Stay here for five minutes.